Hello, and welcome to the MOAS Annual Professional Education Series for Oncology Billing. My name is Nicole East. I'm the Executive Director of MOAS. Today, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers to discuss oncology billing updates, payer contracts, and drug shortages. If at any time you have questions or comment, please feel free to either type them in the chat or unmute your line. I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker today, who most of you know, Bobby Buell. She is the Principal for Provider Services and Reimbursement for OnPoint Oncology. Bobby is a nationally recognized expert in oncology reimbursement, having worked for decades on access issues, billing, coding, and reimbursement for drug therapies. So without further delay, I'll turn it over to Bobby. Good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to be talking to people in my own time zone for a change. I do some of these webinars like at six o'clock in the morning, which is not the greatest thing for me. But uh, I appreciate all of you coming this afternoon. Uh, I don't know if I can answer a lot of questions, but this is a very informal meeting just for you folks in Southern California. So uh, please uh, just unmute your line and ask a question if you have to. I don't mind being interrupted. If you don't want to ask a question in front of your peers, uh, my email, the top, either one of those emails work. And uh, if you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, it's free uh, to everybody. If you're industry, if you're a practice, it doesn't matter. And you can sign up at onpointoncology.com. And you, uh, we put out a newsletter today. Uh, and for those of you who sign up today, you'll get another one. Uh, you'll get a, that newsletter next week. Okay, where, what am I doing here? Okay. This is my disclaimer. One thing, the big disclaimer today is these are the proposed regulations. The final regulation should be coming out uh, right between Halloween and, you know, two weeks from then. Uh, and we, so some of this stuff will change. But what I'm going to tell you during the presentation are the things that you should be looking out for, uh, whether you're an industry or whether you're a practice. Uh, some of the things you should be looking out for in the final regulations, and some things that uh, will greatly impact you if they are changed. So we'll 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 tell you about that uh, as we go along. Uh, this is our agenda for today: the proposed fee schedule rule for those of you who work in offices, uh, and the QPP proposals for those of you who work in offices, and of course the ho proposed hospital outpatient rule. Uh, the proposed rule for 340B repayment, uh, CPT 2024 for oncology only. I, if you're a uh, multi-specialty practice, I don't have all, obviously all the CPT changes, but I do have the ones that are applicable to medical oncology. And then we're going to, this may not be familiar to you, uh, but let me tell you one thing before we get started. On January 1st, there are going to be a boatload, and I mean a boatload, I saw them yesterday, of new HCPCS codes. I'm not, I don't put them out until my December newsletter, which will also have the final regulations in it, uh, but uh, it's really important that you understand how many HCPCS codes are coming out every quarter, and also because so many are coming out, it's a tremendous management issue. So we will talk about that a little bit at the end. So without further ado, we'll talk about uh, the physician fee schedule rule. Uh, as you know, uh, Medicare has relative values for all codes that are not drugs or supplies or pumps or lab. Uh, those are all exceptions to the physician ba payment basics, but uh, they do base everything on relative values and many of our payers, and I'm talking about 95% of our payers in California, use these RVUs and the gypsies to pay you. The gypsies are geographical cost indices. If, if you, we have a payer that doesn't use them in California, we are, you know, to put it politely, we will not uh, get paid properly. And, uh, you know, it's not very good. And then finally, there's the conversion factor, which is peculiar, and I do mean peculiar, to Medicare. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. These are the proposed regulations, and this is where they're located 
on the web if you want to get into these and read them, which I doubt any of you want to, uh, but we read them at on point so you guys don't have to. Uh, also, something that is the same as it ever was is sequestration. There's no provision in the proposed rule to get rid of sequestration. Uh, it will be here um, for the foreseeable future till 2030. And because of what something we'll talk about later, the 340B repayment, which really has nothing to do with Part B, uh, there may be greater sequestration for hospitals at some point. So this is something that everybody, COA, ASCO, ACCC, all of our associations and, and all the professional associations in Part B are protesting is a reduction in the conversion factor. This is a fairly big decrease, as you will see here. Um, to, it's proposed that our uh, conversion factor, and you'll see the... Um, the infusion codes and things like that in a few minutes, uh, but it really is a greater decrease than just 3.36% in both radiation and in medical oncology. Uh, this is not a good thing. That's the bad news. The good news about this whole thing is sometimes CMS just gives you the worst case scenario in the proposed rule and it gets improved or a bill cha uh, changes it at the end of the year and it cushions the blow, even though if they do it at the end of the year, all of our claims are delayed, which is not fabulous either. But I, I really believe that it won't be this bad, uh, hopefully. But you know, you do have to prepare for the worst and you should, if, you, if you're office-based, you should run your numbers. Uh, just to see exactly how this impacts you. And again, I'll show you some real numbers a little later on. This is a specialty impact. And everybody says, well, how does Hemonc really compare to others? Well, Hemonc is supposed to get a 2% decrease. I mean, 2% increase. And Radonc is supposed to get a 2% decrease. But it's actually worse than that because it does not, th these numbers which come from the federal register, do not factor in the changes in the conversion factor, which we all know is a decrease of 3.3%. So, you know, oncology would not be breaking even in that. And also there's another thing that we'll talk about called the gypsy floor. The gypsy floor probably does not impact most of us in California, particularly if you're in the greater Los Angeles area. It probably doesn't impact you. This is mostly for rural areas, but if you're out in central California or uh, in the high desert or somewhere like that, it might really impact you. So you, what you need to do is look at your gypsies in the Federal Register or they're published on the web. Uh, and if you have a 1.0 in your work relative values, and again, if you're in LA, it's not a big deal for you, but it, it because you generally have a work relative value that's higher than that. But if you do see this 1.0, that's another cut for you uh, because CMS is going to abolish this gypsy floor. But one piece of good news is this has been up for repeal. I don't, I can't even count. I lost count on <laughs> I mean, it, it's been up for repeal for years. Uh, and every time they threaten to repeal it because it really impacts rural hospitals the most, it gets pushed back. So this is something that you might see get pushed back again. Also, as we know, the public health emergency uh, actually ended on May 11th of this year. So we would expect some telehealth provisions to expire at the end of 2023 or, or May 11th, which not many of them did. But uh, Medicare established a new category three for some of the things that were passed as a result of COVID. And some of those will be hanging on this year uh, because in category one and two, these are on the permanent list any codes added on a temporary category two or category three will be provisional. Now, the only way that they're provisional is if CMS believes that it, they're probably going to be permanent or that if it really behooves patients, they'll leave it on for right now and consider it later. 
So you won't see many health uh, telehealth services deleted. And we'll talk about the specific ones. One POS, POS does not mean what you think it means. It means place of service. Uh, place of service O2, which is what you know, before COVID, you had to put on telehealth services. That's for the old services. As you may remember, telehealth for Medicare could not be in the patient's home before COVID. They read so, but if the patient is in a facility or the patient is uh, anywhere other than home and they are having telehealth, then you have to use POS2, which gives you a reduction. If the patient's receiving, because this is all about where the patient is, not if the physician's at home or whatever, that's irrelevant. Place of service 10 is when you're providing this uh, service to the patient at home, and then you get the uh, rate that you currently get for whatever service uh, you are presenting. So um, again, don't use place of service too if you if if you're the patient is at home. This is something I love in oncology, and I certainly wish CMS would make it permanent, which they have discussed doing. Thank the Lord. Uh, this change was temporary uh, for COVID, but it will continue through 2024, and that is that the physician. Uh, can virtually supervise the patient in the office. And why is this so great for oncology? Because as you know, when patients get drugs or when, pa uh, when the nurse practitioners are doing visits and, and the physician has to supervise them so they can bill them incident to, uh, sometimes the physician needs to go home for something like to pick up a pair of shoes or whatever, but they can virtually supervise these patients until uh, the end of um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, till the end of next year, which is really, really good. But what we would like to see in the final rule, if possible, is that this virtual supervision becomes uh, actually part of the permanent rules. Some other things that will stay in, in place, uh, the six month requirement for mental health telehealth, which doesn't affect most of you, uh, that will be rescinded until uh, the end of 2024. Expanding the originating sites, again, the individual home can be that. Expanding the practitioners uh, to OT, PT, and speech therapists. And in 2023, we added uh, ma ma marriage and family therapists and mental health counselors to the list of practitioners. And this will start uh, January 1st of 2024. And they can uh, enroll in Medicare. Uh, one of the other great things is the removal of frequency limitations. I get a lot of questions about this. CMS proposes to continue its suspensions of frequency uh, limitations. And this is particularly uh, valuable for subsequent hospital visits uh, that you can build them more than every three days uh, by telehealth or by visits. Also subsequent nursing facility visits, and we probably don't do this that much, critical care consultations, also, uh, physicians, uh, if they're all in telehealth, they can supervise residents in teaching settings uh, if there's a three-way uh, conversation with the patient. Uh, everybody has to be virtual for that. This is something that I just covered in my newsletter uh, this week. Uh, RPM, remote physiological monitoring, and RTM. Uh, are actually services that people in oncology have been asking me about. And I think with RPM, it's, it's, there are possibilities, but uh, next year it might be very difficult for people to bill for this. And even more difficult is RTM. RTM, there's a lot, our remote therapeutic monitoring, even though it says you can monitor adher drug adherence and stuff, it's really aimed at um, patients with cognitive deficits, orthopedics, and uh, pulmonary. It's really not aimed at 
oncology, but there are a lot of people out there pulling scams and saying, oh yes, you can bill for this, no problem. But please read my newsletter and really understand some of these things that you know you have to have in order. It has to be an FDA, like an FDA approved device. The patient has to be monitored for 16 days or more per month. And that's a real barrier for a lot of people. But you can bill RPM and RTM with other care management services, which is something nice about it. This thing, I look what's back. Our old friend G2211, which is an add-on code to your office and outpatient visits. Uh, and basically it's for a patient that you know on an ongoing basis. So you must have an ongoing relationship with the patient. If you somebody's just dropping in for anemia or something, that is not a good thing. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is an add-on for the extra work involved in taking care of some of these patients. I'll show you the descriptor in a minute. It's proposed to be paid at about $16, but remember that's an add-on, it's not a standalone code. Uh, and again, they thought this was going to be very expensive. So what do you think they did to cut costs? They said it can't be paid anytime you bill a visit with modifier 25. So for us, that's a problem because you know that you use modifier 25 every time a patient has a visit with a drug administration. So of course, this is kind of a hindrance to all of us. Here's a descriptor, which I think is extremely vague. And you know that's one thing I don't like about the G codes. You know, with, with ICD-10, we have our coding clinic. So we know we can look up what those mean. With CPT, we have our CPT assistant, and you can look up what those mean. With G codes, there's no recourse except for whatever Medicare gives you and whatever ends up being in the unbundling edits. So it's not that great. Here's what it says. Uh, this can be reported in conjunction with an outpatient or office visit to better account for additional resources associated with primary care or similarly ongoing medical care related to a patient's single serious condition or complex condition. Well, obviously a lot of pan cancer patients, but what do they actually mean by that? And I think they did say that in the final rule, they were possibly going to give you a list, which I think would be of serious conditions or complex conditions. And I certainly hope they do that because I, I do think this is very vague. Also split visits are staying exactly the same as they were in 22, 23, and they will be the same in 24. And it's interesting that CPT is a little more like what Medicare is like. Obviously, if a nurse practitioner or PA and a physician see the patient out of the office, and that, that includes you who are in outpatient facilities, if a, if a physician and a nurse practitioner or PA see the patient, you can always use time. And, or you can use one major component that they do. And, you know, it would be my preference. So it would be medical decision-making, but it must be documented in the record. I spent, uh, I did more than 50% of the time and the total time was blah, blah. And I, you know, sign date and, you know, that you're billing under this person. Same thing with the major component. Make it clear in the, in the notes, who is billing for this? Because I have seen notes where I can't figure out, it's always billed under the physician, but I don't, I, I look at hospital visits and it's very hard to tell if they did more than, uh, if they did one of the key components or whether they did time or whether they did neither. Uh, and th these, Medicare would in fact ding you on that. And of course these must be billed as usual with modifier FS, at least as far as we know at this point. There are new health equity codes. There, there are actually four of them, but these are the three uh, sort of care management codes. Uh, actually, no, there's more than that. The, there are these three, but each one of these has an additional code except for the social determinants of care. For those of you who are in the EOM, I am not sure which of these you can bill, if any, because it's social determinants of care risk assessment. You pro definitely probably can't uh, because of the fact that that is included in the EOM this year. 
So I don't think you can chai and pin. Uh, I don't know whether you can build them or not. I would say pin, there is a chance you could because that's not really in the contract for EOM. But don't take my word for it now. We got to figure out what's going to happen uh, when this is finalized. Obviously, these are not the codes. <laughs> I hope they're not the codes anyway. Uh, so the first one is community health integration services. And this is basically giving patients that you believe have uh, social dis uh, have social problems and needs that will interfere with their diagnosis and treatment that you are integrating uh, you, the patient with community health workers. So if you have a social worker in your practice who's trying to get a patient into a shelter or if they're trying to get patients better nourishment uh, and you know that these are critical to them getting better from cancer, then you can use these codes. And again, the, the next one is specifically for cancer. And this is patient navigation. Obviously, we have a lot of really complex therapies in cancer right now. Uh, uh, gene therapies are coming down the pike, CAR T's, all these are very, very complicated where the patient must navigate. Uh, and even just coordinating uh, the patient's radiation, their lab tests, their imaging, and their chemo can be challenging. So these are for cancer patients specifically, but the, it's not limited to them. So these are the these are the uh, descriptors. These are monthly codes in a calendar month. It must be sixty minutes. Now, pin. It's not really clear whether you can use financial navigators because it says illness navigation and it must be certified or trained personnel under the direction of a physician or other practitioner, which may include a patient navigator or a certified peer specialist, but they must be trained. And, and remember it says may include a navigator and this is 60 minutes per month also. The next one is just administering a risk assessment for social determinants of care. So let's say you're working at LACO, uh, you know, a majority of your patients <laughs> might need this. My husband worked at San Francisco General, the same, same deal. You know, many of your patients would need this risk assessment. But if you're working in another neighborhood, let's say you're working in Pasadena or someplace like that, you know, you, it may be a minority of your patients that would need this. But if you believe uh, that they need this, uh, you would do a certain social determinants of health risk assessment. Or the other alternative you can do is just have every patient fill it out with your, their paperwork. Uh, but it, it, I think you have to administer it, these to the patient. So they might not be able to do this. It's only five to 15 minutes. It's very different than uh, the 60 minutes per month. So this is something you'll definitely consider next year, but it has to have a code number. <laughs> that would be good. Also caregiver training. Uh, and some of our patients would actually qualify for these uh, if they have dementia, uh, they have other intellectual or cognitive disabilities such as chemo brain, uh, physical mobility limitations, or if they have assisted devices or mobility aids. And this is like for training, uh, and these are CPT codes, so you can look them up. Uh, there's some new ones in here. The 9700 ones are new ones. So I'm guessing that these are the ones that CMS is talking about, uh, but we'll see this finalized uh, in the new proposals. And again, this is for training family, uh, you can train the patients, uh, but it's it's actually really to support family and you can do these in a group setting or in a regular setting. So if you think that you're doing this with the families now and want to get paid for it, please check out these codes. They are in CPT and they are final. Uh, this is, uh, some of these are, you know, not, this. these were before the CPTs were finalized. So, um, these these are the payments that are proposed for next year for all these services. Obviously, you know about drug wastage. Every single claim either has to have Jay-Z, if there's single dose vials, sorry, 
if they're Jay-Z, if they're single dose vials and you use the whole thing, Jay-Z. If you have wastage, you know, one line for what was given and what with JW and one line for what was not given. We are seeing a ton of denials for this. I don't know why, because it's been out there for a long time, but please, please, please. Medicare, if you look at my newsletter today, Medicare has put out some wonderful tools for you. They have their FAQs. They have the drugs that absolutely must have either Jay-Z or JW. So you know which ones are single dose vials. So please, please build this. And these are updates to the rules. These mostly affect manufacturers. Uh, but one thing that manufacturers need to know is there probably will be no reports before the towards the end of 2024. Uh, so uh, you probably won't see any, but you might see you might see a preliminary report in the beginning of the year. CMS has also proposed that low volume dosage and some of these they like Chemtrack uh, has a much higher threshold than 10% because it's a very low uh, dose drug. And, and these are just some more things, but this is a real benefit for biosimilars. Uh, biosimilars will be when they're uh, in that uh, proposed period before their pricing comes out, uh, their amount will not su succeed 103% of WAC of the biosimilar or the Medicare Part B drug payment methodology that was in effect in 2003, which was 95% of AWP. <laughs> I don't think they're going to do, it's the lesser, so it's, you know, 106% uh, of the lesser of the WAC or ASP of the re reference biological, or in the case of selected drug during a price negotiation period, 106% of the MFN. And they'll, they're going to adjust uh, beneficiary co-payment. So this is all really good for biosimilars. And most of them are paid at 108% of, of ASP now. These are behavioral changes, which you probably won't get. But this is something that directly uh, applies to cancer. And that is that dental services are covered if they are associated with chemo. Cartique, cell therapy, or anti-resorptive therapy, such as Zometa and, and some of these uh, bone loss drugs that you give to patients. If patients have dental uh, problems, and they will have a list in the final rule, if they have these kinds of problems, they are billable to Medicare, whereas most dental services, and that's true even if you're in the hospital outpatient. Uh, vaccines, the prices have been increased for you this year, and pneumococcal, influenza, hepatitis B, and even shingles is covered for the patient this year. So uh, check it out. And these will be inflated each year by uh, inflation. This e-prescribing thing has been out for a long, long time. One thing that changed is if you have a pharmacy in your practice, you weren't subject to this. Now they say that you are. Uh, so you must prescribe at least 70% of your Part D controlled substance prescriptions uh, electronically. But this, we'll see if this is finalized again. And also our favorite love-hate relationship, appropriate use criteria is paused until further notice. I know people were coding for this and stuff that had imaging, but uh, I, I think even CMS hates this stuff. You can see here some of the numbers, see everything's in red. The one that probably impacts all of us the most is this $5.10 reduction for 96413 that is proposed. Uh, that will add up because <laughs> it's the most frequently used code by uh, cancer practices and uh, it will add up. And you know, we hope that this has changed, but even your office visits are going down. Uh, MIPS did not change uh, tremendously for 2024, but probably the most egregious part of it is your performance threshold uh, will go from 75 points to 82 points. Uh, again, they maintained it through the COVID years, but now uh, in order to even get a neutral uh, adjustment, you must have 82 points next year. The division between all components of MIPS as, as proposed uh, will be quality 30, cost 30, 
promoting interoperability, 25%, improvement activities, 15%. And then it, you may have an MVP. That's a new uh, option for Medicare uh, last year. There is a, an oncology MVP. If you would like to see it, it's on the ASCO website. And you can also go into a, a, a sub, if you're a multi-specialty practice, you can also have um, it, it, you can also have subgroups uh, if you're a multi-specialty practice that can report on their specialty MVP. Uh, but MIPS is was supposed to sunset in 2027, and it's not going to sunset. As it, it, at least in 2027, at some point it might. These are these are some of the new ones this year. Again, the oncology one came out last year. One thing, one one that mystifies me is quality care for ENT. I mean, do they assume there's not quality care? I don't know. But anyway, I thought it was sort of a silly title. But uh, those are some of the new ones. But again, oncology's been around for a while. Uh, quality is going to be 30%, as we said, and these are some of the changes. Uh, see, Appendix D is the part of the fee schedule where this is. Uh, there's some substantive changes to 59 quality measures, so I really suggest that you read these. And again, the data completeness threshold will be 75% uh, coming up in 2026. Cost, we all know this, this is the bane of oncology's existence for this to be 30%. Uh, they propose new me measures, none of which really have a whole lot of things to do with us. Um, so, uh, but these are the new ones that you will see. Improvement activities, they will add five, modify one, and um, remove three improvement activities. That's in Appendix E. And practice-wide quality improvement in the MIPS value pathways, of which EOM is one, would allow uh, clinicians, uh, both in MVP and actually in the EOM, uh, will receive full credit. So if you do the value pathways, you also get full credit for this. And again, interoperability, this is a big change here. Uh, it's going from a 90-day attestation period to 180 days. Uh, also, uh, the physicians must uh, affirmatively, affirmatively attest to completions of self-assessment of their implementation of safety practices. So, uh, but this, this attestation date is very important. And these are some of the advanced APM ones. Uh, they did establish a reward for this year, uh, which didn't, uh, uh, because EOM was not established the whole year. We're not really sure how that impacts them. But with EOM, you know the threshold for you to get payments. So this really isn't so important to you. In terms of the hospital outpatient proposed rule, uh, as you know, hospital outpatient, they get an increase every year. And, uh, you know, it's sort of it's sort of not like being in a physician office, but hospitals and ASCs are also subject to a 2% reduction in the calendar year fee schedule uh, increase if they don't do their quality performance uh, parameters. Uh, for case status drugs, which are drugs that are past their pass-through period, uh, and they're less than they're $140 or less next year, which is a 5% increase, they will be bundled. And this is a decision made by CMS, uh, not by the drug companies. Uh, CMS is also proposing to exempt biosimilars from this packaging pro pro policy when their reference products are separately paid. So this is another benefit for biosimilars out there where they're enjoying lots of new benefits. Hospital transparency, if you're in a hospital, you're supposed to be publishing your fee schedule uh, on your website in a readable format that patients can actually see and read and make decisions about. Uh, it may be must be accurate and complete. It must be, uh, you know, it, hospitals must acknowledge that they're warned. And a lot of hospitals saw this as a cost of doing business and just didn't do it. But here's what happens if you don't do it. 
Uh, Medicare will actually publish your name and how much they find you by. And these are some, uh, some of the ones that have taken place recently. So if you're in a hospital, uh, you can get, you can definitely get a, over a million dollar fine if you're huge. Uh, but if you're a smaller hospital, you can see that some of these like Cherokee, uh, these are smaller hospitals uh, where the fines are pretty low. Also, IOP for people that have substance abuse uh, is the way that they are treated if once they get out of rehab uh, and Medicare will now cover that. And also the inpatient only list, there were no real additions to it this year, except for some new codes, uh, <clears throat> which I, we will see the final ones. Also, there are no, no new prior authorization uh, regulations for, uh, for uh, hospital outpatient, which there have been for the last several years. Uh, comprehensive APCs, uh, there's a couple for op ophthalmology, <coughs> excuse me, and for level two abdominal, peritoneal, biliary, and related procedures. <coughs> Sorry. Also, the dental services will apply to you in hospitals as well as in, off in offices, so that's really good. Uh, and again, we'll be looking for that list uh, when the final rules come out. Also, for those of you in the radio, radio pharmaceutical uh, business, there are five new proposals to unbundle these. A lot of them are expensive and they are bundled. And you can read all these five alternatives and we'll see what CMS comes up with in a couple of weeks. But they are looking to unbundle these. Uh, and if you're in the radio pharmaceutical business, I'm quite sure uh, your Washington office or someone in your facility has probably uh, responded to this. Uh, as you know, last year, uh, 340B was actually reinstated at ASP plus six for 340B hospitals because HHS lost a lawsuit with, uh, with hospitals. And so Medicare has to pay it back. S CMS has already paid back parts of it this year once they lost the case. So now the shortfall will only be from January 1, 2018 till tw September 27th, uh, 2022. So that's when they're going to uh, repay. So what's going to happen is the MACs are going to um, actually distribute these amounts to the hospitals and lump sums starting at, at sometime at the end of this year until the beginning of next year. But that's the good news. The bad news is non-drug items were increased during this 340B period where it was ASP minus 22.5%. So CMS has to repay that due to bu budget neutrality. And HHS estimates that this reduction will take place for the next 16 <laughs> fiscal years. And hospitals are upset about this, believe it or not, uh, from 2025 to 2040. And uh, just one other thing, premiums are going up next year, and some of it's attributable to this payback of 340B. So you, if you look in my newsletter, I have a blurb about it, uh, and CMS has a fact sheet about it on their website. Uh, premiums and some other uh, patient out-of-pockets are going to go up in 2024. Also, we have CPT. At, one thing that's actually October 1st that actually went into effect was the new ICD-10 codes, both ICD-10 CM and PCS. Uh, most of you aren't using PCS, but it, it, it did go into effect. And of course, uh, just as another reminder, JW and JZ. But CPT had a few little changes. It's, it's mostly little wrinkles. First, uh, visit guidelines. Uh, these look a little bit more like CMS, but not totally. For the purpose of reporting E&M services within the context of team-based care, performance of a substantive part of medical decision-making requires that the physician 
or other QHP made approved management plan for the number and complexity of problems addressed at the encounter and takes responsibility for the plan with its inherent risk or complications or morbidity or mortality. But of course, you can also base this on time. But this is just guidelines for when you're using MDM. And I think it's a lot more specific than Medicare is. So by doing so, you must do two out of three of the elements of MDM. If the amount or complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed is used by the physician or other QHP to determine the code level, assessing an independent historian, historian's narrative and ordering of tests are documented, do not have to be personally performed by the physician or other QHP. An independent interpretation of tests of the management plan must be per, must be personally performed by whoever's billing the visit. So that's a nice little clarification in there from CPT. And of course, time for time. CPT codes uh, will no longer specify, uh, and this is for outpatient services, will no longer specify time ranges for both new and established patients codes. Instead, these codes will include a single total time amount, which must be met or exceeded. So in your, uh, in your office or outpatient visits, it will only have a single amount uh, instead of the range that you've seen since 2021. For example, if an oncologist sees a new patient for a total time of 20 minutes, this service would be reported with 202 uh, if, if time is used as a criteria, which has a current time range of 15 to 29. As of January 1, this code descriptor will only specify 15 minutes must be met or exceeded. The next code will specify 30 minutes. Okay, so these are new patient visits, not the hospital outpatient. But I think this is a little helpful because it's it's really, really, really uh, been much more it, much confusion with these ranges. Also, there are new add-on codes that have been introduced for hypothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. I don't know that most of you uh, are doing these, but there are new uh, codes for these. Uh, also, uh, many of you, if there are GYN oncologists out there, uh, our old friend chemotherapy code 6446 is changing. Currently, the descriptor states chemotherapy administration into the peritoneal cavity via indwelling border ca catheter. When the new code set takes effect, this will change to uh, indwelling uh, cath uh, will become implanted. Okay, so it'll be via implanted. It was indwelling, and I flipping it indwelling before it will become implanted. Uh, so that's a, uh, sounds a little more permanent to me, but I don't do these procedures. Uh, effective January one, there will be several changes to the immunization vaccine codes. Uh, there'll be additions of these codes updated to dosing guidance for Janssen's uh, vaccine code. RSV codes are effective, uh, and, and I think they're effective now, but check out the AMA website, and removal of FDA approval pending syndrome symbol for 90678. So these are some of the vaccine changes. And finally, <laughs> I, I might go, this is something that is crazy that is going on. As I told you, there will be a boatload of new codes in January. And as you know, codes that are passed under an FDA designation of 505B2, some of these have been getting since the end of last year, but the bulk of them have been in 2023. Uh, medications that are not therapeutically equivalent will get their own J codes. Some of these are extraordinarily old. Also, within 180 days of launch, a product will get a code. So that it, this is why just we're just getting an avalanche of codes every single time. So and and over 
50, I think 65 codes have been passed so far. In first quarter next year, it's I don't I didn't even count them, but it looks like a ton. So what? Why is this a problem in oncology? Well, here's an example. This is Ben de Musty. Okay, all the yellow ones. These are all generic. All the top ones, as you can see, have their own J code. Well, that's fine. You just ask the manufacturer, and you know what. NDCs go with that code, right? And no. Look at Apotex. There's a bendamustine that's generic for Apotex. They also have a 505B2. So for your payers that require an NDC, which one of these do you use? And it gets worse. If you look at the indications for bendamustine, and th these are all these codes broken out, you can see that some of these are 505 Js, which are generic. Some of these are 505 B2s, and they have their own codes. So you must match the NDC to the code and to the drug, as opposed to just matching the J code to the drug. Because you can see here that some of the indications are different. Uh, so these are you know, where the indications are. So you actually have to go and see what is, if you're using the drug at all under compendia coverage, you've got to make sure that these match, particularly for private payers that require NDCs. And I, I don't have the slide in this presentation, but we have seen NDC dot denials go up exponentially because of this. So please make sure that your pharmacist or your nurses or whomever in your practice, make sure they tell you exactly what drug you're using. And what else should you be doing? Well, here you, you know that the problem is that matching hick picks to J codes can be tricky. You must keep up with the quarterly load of codes, uh, particularly the ones that you use. Obviously, there's even some old antibiotics that have thrown it in here. Uh, the last thing you need is this task, but unfortunately, it has to be for these 505B2s. Also, be sure and check the prices. These Now, you may not be able to receive any every other NDC, but even the pricing organizations have made mistakes on these 505B2 manufacturers that also have a generic drug. So that's even crazier. And there's some of the non-Medicare payers, particularly the, the smaller plans, not your Aetna's and CVS and Cygnus, but particularly some of our Medicaid, our Medi-Cal managed cares and some of the small plans, they don't adopt these J codes really quickly. So you may have to use the generic code. You may have to use some other code because they actually don't have these loaded in their system yet. So what can you do? Make sure you look at the quarterly hit picks and update your charge documents for the drugs you use. Compare prices for all drugs with the same uh, active ingredient each quarter. You might not be able to get them, but you want to know if you're for the drugs you use, if you're getting the best price. Uh, ensure that your pharmacy knows that NDCs are quite important and that some of these manufacturers are not visible because they have to, uh, a generic and a 501c3. And bear in mind, again, that your distributor may not have the most profitable product. And in fact, that may even be in shortage for them. So I thank you very much. Uh, I want to do some shameless promotion here. We do have a manual out that's an internet-based manual that you can train your staff on or even train yourself on. It's called The Introduction to Buy and Bill, and it talks all about drug coding, uh, drug administration coding, E&M, 
uh, and all kinds of things. We have every reference in the world in here. So if you need references for payers, they're in here too. It, there is a cost associated. It's $3.99 for 12 month subscription for one person, but for your entire practice, no matter how many people you have, uh, it's $9.99 per year. Uh, so if you want to sign up, it's on our website, and that's really good. And thank you for being there for our cancer patients. Uh, we, we are winning the war on cancer, even though it doesn't necessarily feel that way every day. And I have enclosed uh, some references in here and some IRA slides for those of you who want to know more about uh, drug pricing under the IRA, because I didn't have time to talk about it. So I did finish on time today and I appreciate it. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy uh, to answer them. Thank you so much, Bobby. Um, that was a lot of information, but a lot of good uh, items in there. The two references that she uh, mentioned, we will include um, with her handouts on the follow-up email with the recording. Um, but if anybody has a question at this moment, uh, either unmute your line or type the question into the chat. And you can email me too. My emails, you know, some people do not like to ask questions in front of their peers and I, I get that. Any questions? Quiet group today. <laughs> well, you are quiet, guys. Um, I don't see any questions going in, but certainly if any come in via email after, we'll forward them to you uh, for follow-up. Thank you so much again for being here today and presenting that information. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. All right, so moving on, we have a few announcements from our corporate sponsors. Um, we'll go ahead and share their chat, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, contact information in the chat in case you wish, wish to contact them uh, offline. But first, we have Garrett Feldman from Kite Pharma. Hello, everyone. How is everybody? That was great. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I know we have a short window. Um, I want to introduce myself. Um, I'm Garrett Feldman with Kite Pharma. I'm currently an account specialist in the Southern California area. We focus on um, educating in the community within the CAR-T world. Uh, primary focus, uh, just of our two products. And I just wanted to kind of briefly give you a description regarding Yascarta and Decardis. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, Yascarta is a CD19 autogalous T cell immunotherapy indicated for the treatment of adult patients with large B cell lymphoma, refractory to first line chemo immunotherapy, or that relapses within 12 months um, of first line uh, chemo immunotherapy. Also, adult patients uh, with relapsed or refractory large B cell lymphoma after two or more lines of systemic therapy, including uh, DLBCL. Um, Decardis is also a CD19, uh, just directed at ontotogalous uh, T-cell immunotherapy indicated for the treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory mantle cell. Um, and you have a bunch of representatives out there in the Southern California area, and we're very blessed to have ATCs in our neighborhood in San Diego and USC and City Hope, uh, UCLA, Cedars, um, and Irvine. Um, and if there's anything that we can do um, or answer any questions, um, Chrissy's going to put my information. Uh, we do have a lot of information that we can drop off, especially with our Kite Connect um, to make this a little relevant uh, for your uh, patients and for the ATCs and just making this process um, a little easier. Um, we can drop those off at any time. Um, and that's it. I know we have a short window if there's any questions, but, um, you know, we'd love to hear from anybody. Um, and we're here to help along the way. Thank you so much, Garrett. Thank you, um, Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. We will move on next to Aaron Bowman from Merck. Hi, guys. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. 
So yeah, again, kind of just a quick hello. Thank you for having us on here. Um, I'm the field reimbursement manager for Southern California for Merck. I specifically usually talk to you guys about Keytruda. And so Keytruda is an immunotherapy um, used for a wide range of indications. Our, our PI is pretty thick, so I won't read all of it, but I know that you know I talk to lots of different oncology offices um, around financial assistance. I mostly you know, guide people to our Merck Access Program. Um, and so that's where we can assist patients for financial assistance with Keytruda. And so, yeah, if anyone has any questions, definitely my contact information is there. I always just, my, my main thing is definitely wanting everyone in Southern California who's using Keytruda to know that I'm your person um, for that, for field, you know, for any reimbursement or coverage issues. And I can always come to your office and do, um, you know, education as well as just answer questions if you want to give me a call anytime. So yeah, that's that's kind of my, my little spiel. <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you both for, you know, continually supporting Moask and its efforts. We appreciate all that you and your companies are doing. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. All right. So we're moving right along. We're about 20 minutes uh, ahead. Um, all right. I'll move on to our next speaker. We have uh, Dana Belfontaine Jr., CEO of Code Tools. Dana, you want to go ahead and share your screen? Perfect. Can you hear me, Dana? Yes, ma'am, I can. Okay, excellent. Um, so uh, Code Tools Alliance has the expertise to undertake all of your payer contracting, credentialing, um, negotiation with professionals who's, who've worked on both sides of these uh, conversations for decades. Their process has been proven to ensure that your practice is able to maximize revenue for years to come. So without further delay, I'll turn it over to Dana, who's going to run through the Code Tools platform. Thank you, Nicole, and good afternoon, everyone. As Nicole stated, my name is Dana. I'm the CEO and founder of Code Tools. Just a brief summary about myself. I've got 10 years of surgical experience in a level one trauma center while I was in the Air Force. Left the Air Force in 92, came to my current city, obtained an accounting and finance degree, was immediately hired as a controller for a large multi-specialty, multi-physician group. Spent about 10 years with them, left with one of the ENT doctors to start his own practice. I told him I'd give him a year, and I did. For the next handful of years, I spent that time starting medical practices from scratch. I really like to do that. And one of the things that became very apparent to me is you could have the best facility, the best staff, the best everything. And if these payer contracts are not properly managed, it is disastrous for any type of practice. <laughs> And I'm not sure if he's with us right now, but he'll be joining us, our lead negotiator, Trey. Let me point him out briefly. I came to our About Us page. And there I am. Catherine is our licensed Microsoft VBA expert. She is responsible for product development. And here is Trey Lee Gone. Now, Trey and I are about the same age, both have about three plus decades of experience in this space. Trey has played in a little different ball field than me. Over the past three decades, he has been building ACOs, IPAs, and the like. There's Trey's contact information. We'll have that ready available to you. And last but not least, here is Terry. She is responsible for onboarding our clients. So before we jump into the analyzer, I'd like to point out a few things via the website. As we go through this demo, we are going to be focused on three main topics here. Managing and analyzing your payer contracts and fee schedules in one simple place. As you might guess, that one simple place is our analyzer. We want to see what the different reimbursement rates do to your practice in total and by individual CPT code. Our product is and always has been licensed by the AMA. We want to compare your reimbursements on an ongoing basis, testing the adequacy of your charges. That refers to underbilling, so we'll take a look at that in just a moment. We also want to test the payer offers during the negotiations. Oftentimes, payers will come to us and say, Dana, here you go. Here's a better offer. Well, we'll see about that. Sometimes they will increase an E&M code and decrease your larger ticket code. So we want to make sure that's not happening. We want to test their counter offers and the like. And just a couple more things via the website here, and then we'll jump into a real-life analyzer. 
want to scroll down here just a little bit. And let's take a look at this creating payer letters section. Now we know based on decades of experience, a proper timeline to negotiate the contracts is 120 days before the anniversary date. Now, we're not saying that contracts can't be negotiated at any other point in time. What we are saying here is if they are set up and managed properly, we want to make sure these contracts are negotiated 120 days before each anniversary date, whether it be year contract, two year or three year. Now, for our clients that use the analyzer, they are notified of any contracts that have hit that 120 day mark. So what this notification is saying here is, hey, Dana, these contracts have hit 120 days. Do you want to start the renegotiation process? With that being said, let's jump into a real live analyzer. Here we are. Here's our notification saying, hey, Dana, hey, folks, these contracts are within 120 days. Do you want to create the renegotiation notice? For now, I'm going to say no, because we can create this renegotiation notice on demand, and we will here shortly. Let me point out, let me just get this window organized here. And Trey is joining us now. Nicole, I apologize. I'm having a little bit of a hard time with this menu bar here. Not quite sure how to hide that. We'll get it here in just a moment. Okay, so here's our contract analyzer. And we said no to that notification. We'll address that renegotiation notice in a moment. Let's take a look at some of the functionality of the analyzer. Now we construct this for our clients based on the contracts, fee schedules, codes, charges, and the like. Click on a CPT code. There is the AMA CPT code description. We'll want the physician to practice his codes and their charges. Now, all of the fee schedules are gonna fall into one of two categories. Either it's going to be a percentage of Medicare or it's not. If it's not, we call it a market fee schedule. You could easily replace the word market with proprietary. They're both going to fall into one of two categories. Payer without a fee schedule. This might be where the client does not have the most current contract and or fee schedule. We would come over here and enter that payer without the fee schedule and request that fee schedule and or contract from the payer. And let me come over here to create payer letters. We'll take a quick look at the letters that come with your analyzer. So here are the templated letters requesting a copy of your contract and or fee schedule. Here's our renegotiation notice that we'll take a look at in a moment. A negotiation appeal if need be, a termination if need be, and a notice to your payer patients if you decide to terminate that contract. Remove a payer, edit a payer, that's pretty straightforward. Show hide payer, that's pretty straightforward. A lot of our clients said to me, well, Dana, we don't necessarily wanna see all the payers side by side. Not quite sure I understand that, but if our clients want it, so be it. Add edit fee schedule. We'll take a look at this in just a moment. We can see we've got Aetna without a fee schedule. Add edit allowed amounts. Now, there is no API interface with this analyzer. That's to say it does not interact with your EHR system. I brought it out of that environment for a couple of reasons years ago. But we still want to make sure that the payer is allowing the contracted amount. We know based on last year's data, payers were running a 13 to 19 percent error rate. That's almost one out of five claims. So we'll take a look at how we can check their allowed amount to the contract amount here in just a moment. Add edit billing frequency. This is where we're taking a little deeper dive, um, maybe looking at carve out surgical codes, drug codes and the like. Show high years of Medicare. Our analyzer is running back to 2011. We're not seeing too many contracts before 2011, but if we do, it's certainly not a problem for us. And while we're here, let me hide one more year of Medicare just to pull that last payer into view. There we are. Add remove CPT code, pretty straightforward. We are running CPT codes as well as HCPCS level two codes through this analyzer with our licensing agreement with the AMA. Go to CPT code, pretty self-explanatory. Calculate totals. Here are totals down here. We'll take a look at those in just a moment. This open button right here, we are looking at the charge entry sheet right now. We've also got the contracts inventoried and cataloged. 
And you can see we've got um, Nicole's company right here in the practice name, her name, city, state, the years of service, and the NPI's tax ID. Those are just plug numbers for the demo for today. Each analyzer comes with a set of instructions. We encourage our clients to get in there, use it, play around with it. If for any reason the client loses or messes up the analyzer, we resend it to them at no charge. If for some reason Medicare changes their data mid-year, we update our analyzer within 24 hours and resend it to you at no charge. So coming back to the charge entry sheet, you can see we have Aetna here, but we don't have a fee schedule for Aetna. Let's attach a fee schedule to them and see how easy this is. Add fee schedule, select Aetna. Now it's asking us here if we want to do a market fee schedule or a percentage of Medicare. We can switch between both types of fee schedules at will. For now, let's do a market fee schedule. Now it's asking us if we want to upload the data here or not. If we said no, we would simply do our data entry here. But we construct this for you, so I'm going to select yes. Let's drop in that Aetna market fee schedule. And there we go, everything is auto-calculated for us. Now this red box here is an alarm bell for us. This goes to testing the adequacy of your charges. Every contract contains lesser of language. So what this is saying here is we, Aetna, are going to pay you, Dana, the lesser of, the contract amount or your build amount. So in this instance, although the contract calls for 777, I'm getting paid 750. That's why they put that lesser of language in that contract. So we wanna make sure that the charges are set appropriately. When we see this red box like this, we're probably reaching out to the client saying, hey, let's take a look at your charge master together. We need to make some revisions and we wanna do those right away because we know the client's sending out claims pretty much on a daily basis. Let me open up some columns here and let's take a little deeper dive. Now, we also want to see the physician's charge as a percentage of the contract amount. We should see a nice systematic number throughout this column here. If we don't, we're probably reaching out to the client and say, let's review your charge master together, see if there's any improvements that need to be made. We also want to see the contract amount as a percentage of current year Medicare. Now, we all just loaded Aetna as a market fee schedule. But we want to see that fee schedule as if it were a percentage of current year Medicare. We want to see that by individual code, and we want to see that in total. So although Aetna was a market fee schedule, they're coming in at about 113% of current year Medicare. One of the reasons we want that number in our back pocket is during the negotiations. And while we're here, let me just summarize the process. We are looking at your contract and your contract language to make sure there's nothing detrimental to you in there i.e. a three-year fee schedule, three-year contract without any escalators to the fee schedule. We are also looking at the fee schedule language and the fee schedule, making sure there's nothing detrimental in there for you as far as the language, i.e. unilateral amendment rights. That gives the payer the ability to change the fee schedule without notifying you. We'll have none of that. During the negotiations, if the payer wants their unilateral amendment right, they can have it but they can't have it to the fee schedule. If they're going to change the fee schedule, they must notify us. The next thing we're looking at is the financial data through the analyzer. We are looking at the financial data in your market. We are defining leverage with you, performing a SWOT analysis, and then putting our negotiation packet together. A mistake that a lot of practices will make is they will go to the pair and say, we want more. That will never work. Payers have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders, not to medical practices. That's just the world that we live in. So we are going in there armed with data, 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 your SWOT analysis, the leverage, and about five or six decades of experience. Moving on, I said earlier, we want to check the payer allowed amount to the contract amount. This is that 13 to 19% error rate from last year. So let's come here to add edit allowed amounts and we'll stay with that now. Select OK. Now this is a file that's retrieved from any EHR system. And let's drop that in there. And everything's auto calculated for us. Now you could see that the Aetna has been allowing 750 because this practice has been charging 750. That's why it's so critical to get that fixed immediately. 
Now, $27 per occurrence might not sound like a lot, but let's drop in some billing frequency. Again, staying with that now. And again, this is a file from any EHR system. Well, now we're not talking about $27, we're talking about $5,400. Now, if this charge was set appropriately, appropriately, let's call it $800, and they were allowing 750, that is that 13 to 19% error rate that I spoke of earlier. So if it's a mistake on their part, your charge is set appropriately, this is a mistake on their part, and this is money we could and would go chase down. Let me close up some columns here. And let's discuss that contract renegotiation notice that I said no to earlier. And before I do that, I'd like us to take a look at the contract inventory. And I'd like us to note that this area here is blank, renegotiation notice created. And I'd also like us to take a look at our folder setup. This would this is identical to our clients. And I'd like us to note that there's just one folder here, payer letters. So let's come back to the analyzer and let's create that renegotiation notice that I said, <clears throat> pardon me for clearing my throat, that I said no to in the beginning. Contract renegotiation notice. Now we remind our clients again of the days to anniversary. This is such a critical date. Every contract contains what we call an evergreen clause, simply means automatic renewal. So you know the payer's not going to say anything about the fee schedule. And if the practice doesn't say anything about the contract, that contract is just going to automatically renew. This is how practices end up with outdated stale fee schedules. So again, we remind our clients of the day's to anniversary, just so they could have it in their mind's eye that the renegotiation process is coming up. So let's stay with that now, and let's select OK. Now, what the analyzer is doing is looking at the practice name, physician name, city state, years of service, the NPIs, the tax ID, letterhead, and creating a folder for us. And we'll be notified here in just a moment that the letter has indeed been created. And here we are, here's our notification that the renegotiation notice has been created. I'm going to select OK. Now you can see that the date was automatically entered in here for us. I did not do that. That lets us know when the renegotiation process has started. Let's come take a look at our folder setup. And you can see that the analyzer has created a folder for us. I did not do that. Let's jump in there and take a look at the renegotiation notice. Here we are. There's a letterhead for today's demo. So we've got our renegotiation notice, today's date, the payer rep information. We've got the practice name right here with 20 years of service, that city in California. And we've also got the client signature line right here. Now, this is not a sign and send letter. This is the letter that we start with. And this is where we're incorporating that contract language, fee schedule language, SWOT analysis, your leverage, the market data. And we're also comparing payers to each other through the contract analyzer. So this is the starting point for us to incorporate all of that information into the letter. We send it to our client for them to sign and send. It's required for them to sign and send because they are the party to the contract, we are not. So we simply generate all of this renegotiation packet, if you will, for the client to sign and send. We also ask them to CC us during the negotiations just so we can be informed of anything that's going on. So there's the renegotiation notice. Let's come back to the analyzer. And when we're in negotiations with the payer, as I stated earlier, they're going to send us an offer and say, here you go, Dana, here you go, client, here's our offer, it's better. Well, as I said earlier, we'll see about that. So here's where we test the payer's offer. We've got the variables, the year, the percentages, and the like. If we've got carve-outs for any surgery, there are the surgical subsections right there. So we simply enter our data right here, and that's going to give us a comparison to the current offer to make sure that it is indeed a better offer. And I just want to go through the analyzer here and make sure I've covered all of the functionality. And I believe I have. Nicole, do I have time to move on to our proposal, ma'am? Yes. Okay. And we are going to put up where you can request this proposal if you like. 
Now, this is the standard proposal for every client across the United States. And I'm just going to go through this briefly. If you request a proposal, you'll have plenty of time to take a look at it. And we've set this one up for Nicole. So there's our cover letter. Improving your practice. That's a video from our website. Here's an overview and a testimonial. This is one of my favorite clients, Dr. Rogu. He's a pediatrician that runs a clinically integrated network out of New York City. Dr. Rogu called me and said, Dana, I know how to negotiate my own contracts, but I've got some contracts in a filing cabinet on a computer, and I've just got contracts everywhere. No problem, Dr. Rogu. Send them to us. We'll build the analyzer. And he negotiated his own contracts. Key deliverables. Complete contract management. We talked a lot about this, the payer analysis, the rate analysis. And I'm just summarizing for time's sake today. I could talk about this stuff until next Thursday if you let me. Now, we say anywhere from 90 to 150 days. This is a very conservative measure. I'd say the reality of it is once we get our hands on the contracts and fee schedules, Trey is negotiating these contracts probably within 30 to 45 days. As you might guess, the slowest part of this process is getting our hands on the contracts and fee schedules. And if our clients do not have them, we'll address those in just a moment. How often are we successful? Very conservative number. I'd say this is probably more about 90%. And one of the reasons is, there's a couple of, a few reasons here. Um, probably the main one is a lot of practice don't try and negotiate. They think they can't. And if they do, they go to the payer and say they want more. And that just never, ever works. And again, we've got five or six decades of experience doing this. We know what we're doing when we go into these negotiations. The increase amount, 10 to 12%, of course, that varies with every client. Some folks will say to me, well, Dana, can you guarantee me a dollar increase? I would never do that. And I suggest to clients, if somebody would do that, you might want to go the other way. How can you guarantee an increase without seeing the contract and or fee schedule? Now, again, our negotiations are performed by Trey Ligon, the CEO of American Medical Network. And Trey is with us now. We'll have a Q&A at the end if you have any questions for Trey. Now, Trey will offer some retainer services that I just do not. And here's a summarized list of them. If you would like a more detailed list, we can certainly get that to you. And in your proposal, here's Trey's contact information. He is also Pacific Standard Time, his email, and there's his calendar if you'd like to schedule an appointment with him. Okay, let's get to the cost. The analyzer is a one-time, one-time only charge of 4000 You own it forever and ever, amen. We update the analyzer for you annually at a small fee, and we'll see that in just a moment. So the analyzer comes loaded with your top five payers, contracts, and fee schedules. Now, when I say payer, Let's take Aetna, for example. You might have an Aetna Medicare Advantage, HMO, and a PPO. That counts as one payer. And if they have different fee schedules for different products, we definitely want to see that. Now, we'd like to start with your top five. That's not to say we can't do six through 60, but as I tell folks that all have priority, none have priority. So one time, one time only, and you own it. It's yours. It's on your computer. Obtaining contracts and fee schedules. Some folks will say to me, well, Dana, we have no idea where our contracts and fee schedules are. No problem. We'll hunt them down for you at 175 per payer, no matter how many products we have. Some folks will say to me, well, Dana, I think we have two or three. Okay, no problem. Send us those two or three. Let's see what you have. <clears throat> Pardon me for clearing my throat. And we'll go from there. Now, the negotiations. It is 175 per hour, not to exceed 950. Might take us two hours or three hours, and Trey can speak to this if you have any questions, but it will not exceed 950. So what we're doing here, once we've got your analyzer built out, Trey is working, we're all working together to define that SWOT analysis, the leverage, and the like. Some folks will say to me, well, Dana, do we have to pay for all five negotiations up front? Certainly not. What I suggest to folks is let's start with the first one. Once we get done with the first one and you see that rate increase, I am pretty confident you are coming back for subsequent negotiations. And that, in fact, how it is working out. Trey is just, for lack of better words, he is killing it for the negotiations. 
again, we've got decades of experience doing this. Pardon me, somebody's entering the room. Okay, updating the analyzer. That's a $450 charge, but certainly anybody that purchased the anal purchases our analyzer in the last quarter, we're not going to charge them a update fee just a few short months from now. So anybody who purchases in the last quarter is going to be good until the end of 2024. What happens if Medicare changes the data mid-year? Again, we update it and resend it to you at no charge. Now, being a member of this organization who's sponsoring this meeting today, and we thank them, Nicole, we are going to offer you a free membership to our member resource center. And I will point that out very quickly. Here's our member resource center. And please just take this literally. This is chock full of resources for any kind of medical practice. There's a video source, a video of what this member resource can, contains and the like, medical forms, online discussion forms, just a member resource center. You will have free access to that. Let me scroll down here a little bit. Okay. For our clients that move forward with us, I'd like to point out this um, third paragraph right here. So assuming our client, they re they've received the demo, they received the proposal, they signed the proposal, I signed the proposal, they're going to receive an invitation to our collaboration folder. We use a program called Box. It's very similar to Dropbox, but Box is HIPAA compliant. Now in no way, shape or form are we sharing or looking at any kind of PHI whatsoever. But if our clients want that warm fuzzy of HIPAA compliancy, so be it. So Terry, again, she's responsible for onboarding our clients. Here is her information right here. And let's go take a quick look at that box account. And I'm almost done here, Nicole. Okay, here's the box account. And this is the same for every single client across the United States. We'll take a look at our one of our last clients. This is a pediatric therapist out of Maryland. Our analyzer is based on locality. Um, if I remember correctly, there are about 100 localities throughout the United States. We've got them all covered. This client is in Maryland 99. So here's the collaboration folder, and everybody is invited to this. Here I am. There is the business manager, Trey. Terry, responsible for onboarding. There is the practice owner. And I believe this is another practice manager who is still pending They've received the invitation, but not have accepted yet. So real quickly, contracts and fee schedules. This is where we compile the contracts and fee schedules together. We've also got a couple documents in here. So here are the practices codes. If we need to request the certain allowables from the payer, this is an Excel spreadsheet that we attach to the letter that's derived from the analyzer requesting the allowables for the specific CPT codes. The renegotiation questions, let's take a quick look at that. Four or five simple questions for the client to fill out. And this gets us a starting point for defining the leverage. And we're all working together. This is a team effort to define this leverage and do the SWOT analysis. Your unique procedures. What are the benefits to your patients? What do you do clinically that reduces the cost for the payer? This is a big one. Just a couple more questions here. What's the value of your practice and anything else that we want to define? Again, we are not just going to the payer and saying this practice wants more. We've got to make the case for you. And we're going to do everything possible to do that. So coming back, and you could see I should have pointed out, let me point it out real quick. We've got a folder for each one of the payers where we're compiling the contracts and or fee schedules for that client. The download folder, this houses their contract analyzer and their payer letters folder. Letterhead codes and charges, pretty straightforward. Their proposal and invoice. This source document is what we use internally. Let's take a quick look at this overview note. And again, this is the same for every single client across the United States. And here we are, there is the client. Sign the proposal on 829, invoice sent, invoice paid. There's our contact information with this particular practice. Here is the information that we need, NPIs, tax ID, practice letterhead, the practices, codes, and charges. 
Now we've got a grid built out here for us. Jake has identified their top five payers. We are going to exclude Medicaid. So once we get our contracts and fee schedules, we either accept it, the contract we either accept it or we don't. One reason we might not accept it is the client might upload a blank contract with no signatures. Same thing with the fee schedule. Once we get our hands on it, we either accept it or we don't. I can't think of one instance where we've not accepted it. This is where Catherine is responsible for converting the fee schedules into Excel if need be. We get fee schedules in Word format, PDF format, and the like. So this is where Catherine is responsible for converting those. Now, some folks will say to me, Dana, do we have to wait until we get all five contracts and fee schedules before we start negotiations? Certainly not. Once we get a contract and or fee schedule into the analyzer, Trey is off and running. We often get contacted by a client and they'll say, well, Dana, we've been negotiating for about two or three weeks now. We're in over our head. Can you jump in, jump in here and help us? And we certainly can. So the most important thing in my mind is to get the contract and or fee schedule to get that negotiation process started. So that is the box account. And Nicole, I think I am finished with the demonstration. If you want to open it up for Q and A. Sure, thank you so much. So if there's any questions, feel free to type it in the chat or unmute your line. All right. Well, I we have put uh, Dana's contact information in the chat in case you have any questions after. Um, Dana, thank you for presenting that information. Uh, we appreciate it. You are very welcome. Thank you for having us. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their day. I hope you do as well. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. So moving on, we have a couple more announcements from our corporate sponsors. Um, I don't see Bobby Son from Pfizer. So we will go on to Josh Snook from Regeneron. Hey, everybody. Can you see me and hear me? Hi, yes. Nice to be here and uh, really appreciate you guys allowing us to help sponsor uh, this meeting. So great information. Um, and as mentioned, my name is Josh Snook. I am the reimbursement manager for one of the PD-1 inhibitors. Uh, the medication is called Libtio and generic scientific name is Simiplumab. And uh, as I'm sure many of you know, you probably work with some reimbursement managers, but just to, for those that don't, um, my role really kind of helps support your offices uh, around prior authorizations, appeals, uh, claims, um, denied claims, of course, probably more often than anything. And then probably the two most common areas that uh, I'll help support offices would be around uh, copay assistance for commercial patients and patient assistance, compassionate use for patients um, who may be underinsured, uh, don't have insurance, um, or maybe looking to uh, explore some something outside of the uh, indication. So Anyhow, um, just wanted to give a very brief uh, kind of one of the things that may resonate with you and some of the folks that you're working with at the offices um, that for, from a LibTio standpoint, people have really been gravitating to. Uh, so for the patients when they're getting enrolled into LibTio Surround, our hub services, one of the things that comes up pretty often is us as the manufacturer, Regeneron, covering the commercial copays. Um, and so just wanted to let you guys know, of course, we do have that traditional paper enrollment form. Many people still uh, use that route, but uh, a lot more folks nowadays are gravitating to our online portal, which is also available. And just wanted to give you guys uh, just a, if, if that's something that, you know, oftentimes financial counselors, sometimes the folks in billing as well, will identify patients that either have you know, a deductible associated with Libtio, maybe a co-payment, co-insurance. Um, from a commercial copay standpoint, we will cover up to $25,000 a year for any U.S. residents. Um, and, uh, and, and I've yet to see that $25,000 threshold exceeded. So if the online portal is something that 
you or one of your staff members might be interested in, um, please take down my information. I think it'll be included here in the chat. And feel free to reach out to me either via email, uh, call, text, and I can set up some time uh, with you or your staff member to help register, provide a site demonstration. One of the really convenient things about our online portal um, is, is going to be the fact that it does not require any patient signatures or physician signatures. And so, as I think a lot of us know, since the pandemic, still many of us are working remotely. And so, in the event you have a staff member that's working remotely, that's that's oftentimes uh, one of the reasons that they really seem to like these online portals, especially the one for LibTile. So, thank you again for allowing me to help be here uh, on behalf of Regeneron, our LibTio team. Really look forward to seeing all of you out there in the community and hope you have a great rest of the meeting. Thank you so much, Josh. We appreciate all that you and Regeneron do in supporting our efforts. Thank you for being here today. Um, okay. Is Hi, Karen, or Dr. Haggerty, thank you so much for joining. Uh, let me go ahead and make Delighted you- to be here, thank you. Let me go ahead and make you a co-host so you can share your screen. And okay, you should be good to go. All right, let's see if I can do this without making too much of a mess. All right, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Okay, and are you seeing my slides? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so I will go ahead and just dive in. I'm just going to minimize the screen here. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk to you today about drug shortages, um, some basic background, sort of what's happening now and what ASCO is doing in this space. So, um, so just to start, Obviously, I think, you know, everybody saw the news back in July about the um, tornado that hit the Pfizer plant, and it turned out to be one of the largest sterile injectable facilities in the world, which, of course, caused a ton of heartburn. And when we first heard about this, of course, um, in many of these situations, there is no way of knowing which drugs are made at which facilities. And when you visited their website, um, it said we make anesthesia and you know, analgesia, therapeutics, and it's like, okay, which ones? And then we did eventually find out, but it took about a week to figure out what, you know, what was made there. Um, so just sort of opening with um, some of the issues that can lead to drug shortages outside of market issues. Um, so again, just a little background Shortages come from a variety of places. I think many of us will remember the um, the IV saline uh, solution shortage due to Hurricane Maria. And then, of course, uh, much more recently, we had the um, Intas um, issue, which uh, led to the cisplatin shortage. Uh, many years ago, there was a report of a uh, mass pig die off in China that actually ca uh, caused a shortage of heparin. And then also more recently, um, Acorn uh, filed for bankruptcy, uh, leading to more drugs being pulled out of the market. So as I mentioned earlier, there, you know, the, the natural disasters, things like that happen in addition to market factors, but market factors really are at the base of a lot of these shortages and breaking down the market factors into different areas. Um, obviously, uh, you've got a lot of XUS um, finished dose forms, active pharmaceutical ingredients, um, also known as API, and then key starting materials. It can be hard for companies to enter the US market. A lot of facilities and physician practices practice just in time inventory, so leaving very little in the way of a buffer. Um, the the drugs that go into shortage, especially in oncology, tend to be sterile injectables that have very, very, very low margins. And so it's difficult to have the investment to keep investing in the plants. Certainly, anti-competitive behavior can be an issue. We've seen that before. Um, co consolidation, just like in a lot of other markets, we mentioned, you know, XUS production outsourcing. Contracting practices can also help lead to shortages and then geographic concentration where, for example, you have a lot of plants in a place like um, Puerto Rico or in certain areas, India or China. So I'm just going to quickly go through some um some statistics on shortages themselves and some surveys that are showing what's happening out there on the ground. So 
uh, I always like to show the next couple of slides. They get updated on a regular basis because they give you a good feel for sort of where we are numerically. So this comes from the University of Utah Drug Information Service, UUDIS. And you can see from this graph, they track back to 2001. And many of you who've been around for a while will remember the particularly acute shortages that we experienced uh, starting in 2010 and worsening in 2011. And that was a high for the number of new drug shortages. So far this year, we are at 129. The year's not over yet. And so that looks better than 267. But the next slide shows where the problem really is. So yes, we have fewer new drug shortages, but if you look at the trend, which is the new plus already existing, so adding those both together, you can see for 2023, which are the last two points on this graph, that we are approaching levels of um, active shortages that we haven't seen in about a decade since 2014. Um, so you will all know that chemotherapy is almost always in the top five drug classes in shortage. I think we had a year or two where it wasn't in the top five, but that's pretty rare. We're almost always in the top five. And again, this will be no surprise um, that the injectable, it's the sterile generic injectables that, that cause most of the heartburn. So moving to a few surveys. So the American Society of Health System Pharmacists uh, did a survey um, on drug shortages and they conducted this survey from mid-June to mid-July and they broke it down by um, the impact, whether there was you know no impact, minimal, moderate, or critical. And you will notice that on this list here on the right, that chemotherapy was reported um, as having a critical impact 57% of the time. So they define critical impact as rationing, canceling, or delaying treatments or procedures. So again, looking at that bar graph on the right, you can see that chemotherapy um, far outpaced the other um, drug groups in terms of the criticality of the impact. Um, NCN uh, did two surveys. They did one in May, then they did a follow-on one, follow on one, excuse me, in September. So this is the May survey, and they got responses from 27 sites. And on the left-hand side is carboplatin, and on the right-hand side is cisplatin. So in terms of experiencing a shortage of carboplatin, 93% of the sites said yes. And for cisplatin, 70% said yes. Um, however, for um, for cisplatin on the right hand side, you can see that even though seventy percent of um, respondents were experiencing a shortage, a hundred percent were still able to uh, treat their patients as intended. However, um, on the carboplatin side, only sixty four percent said yes, we were able to treat all of our patients. So then this follow on. Um, um, survey, which, which, as I mentioned, was done in September, um, and looking again at carboplatin and cisplatin, you can see that all of the numbers got better, except on the bottom right-hand side, where now in September, um, only 88% of centers said that they were able to treat all of their patients as intended as compared to 100% in the earlier survey. They also asked if there were other drugs in short supply. And as you'll see here, I don't think any of these drug names will come as a surprise to you. Methotrexate, 5-FU, fludarabine, decarbazine. Uh, Doxil is certainly um, rising up the list in terms of a concern, um, vinblastine and so on. And you'll see that only 14% um, reported that they had no other shortages. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of our own data we looked at. So our cancer link um, discovery data. So we looked at uh, administered doses of cisplatin and carboplatin from uh, all the way back in November of 22 through September 11th of this year. And uh, 47 practices reporting it was 40% uh, percent health, uh, health systems, 15% academic, 9% large private slash independent, and 36% small private or independent. Um, so the take home message from these graphs where blue is carboplatin and red is cisplatin was obviously you're going to see, you know, normal sort of spikes up and down, but there was not a decrease 
in the administered doses seen in these practices. So then we broke it down further by practice type and everybody had a bit of a dip somewhere between um, mid-June to mid-September. So for cisplatin, uh, the hospital and health systems and academic centers had decreased numbers of doses mid-June to mid-September, whereas for carboplatin at academic um, centers, that dipped from early May to mid-September, and then the large independent practices saw a bit of a decline um, July through August. So what does all this cost? It has been estimated that drug costs alone annually cost 230 million in terms of drug prices spiking when there's a shortage and then um, looking at labor costs, and this was only for hospitals, it didn't include independent practices, that was estimated to be $359 million a year um, for the human resources required to help manage drug so shortages, whether that was um, seeking access to the product or to alternative product, um, strategies to work around shortages, um, technology updates, meaning things like, you know, even simple things like having to reprogram program your EHRs and reprogram pumps, um, and then, of course, preparing for future shortages. So basically, we don't know quite a bit about what is going on behind the scenes, and that is a big part of the problem. So Again, this was a UUDIS investigation in 2022, and they looked at what were the reasons that manufacturers are reporting as um, the reason for the shortage. You recall that um, about, I think, 2012 or 2013, there was a new requirement that manufacturers had to report to FDA if they anticipated a shortage or knew there was going to be an impending shortage. And so over 50% said the, either reported the reason is unknown or would not provide. So basically over half of the shortages, we don't have a given reason as to why they're happening. Um, and in terms of the role of the FDA, so the FDA is able, if you start at the beginning of the process and you look at raw materials up through fine chemical manufacturing, then you move into API manufacturing and finish dose form, the FDA has information about API and finished dose form manufacturing and it inspects those facilities, but it doesn't go back further down the chain. And one thing to note here is there's a bit of a disconnect between the API manufacturing and the finished dose form manufacturing, because while the FDA knows where these facilities are, it doesn't necessarily know how much of which API is going to which finished uh, finish dose facility. So there's a disconnect in the information there. Um, so following on to that, um, these two pie charts um, represent generic drugs only, not brand drugs. And so if you look at the percentage of finished dose manufacturing facilities for generic drugs, which is on the left hand side, you'll see that of those facilities, 37% are in the U.S., Whereas for the API, only 13% are in the U.S. And again, just to emphasize, this is percent of facilities, not percent or volume of drug. Okay, so as I think I've implied several times as I've been talking, um, this is not new. We have been seeing this for years. We just see acute spikes um, over time. There's a chronic background of drug shortages that many facilities and practices live with all the time. They deal with it. It's their, their patients are barely aware that it's happening because everybody's so used to dealing with it. And then we have a really bad shortage. It's so critical. You can't manage it um, like we saw with cisplatin and carboplatin. So in terms of having been here before, um, back in June of 21, the White House issued what we call the 100-day report. And this report was done um, via executive order, and it looked at four different areas, and it was spurred by the pandemic. And of course, the area that we were most interested in was the pharmaceutical supply chain. So they came out with multiple recommendations in this report, and I've just listed them here. I don't expect you to, to read them, but basically, um, they want they the two priority objectives that they wanted to um, to recommend was improving supply chain transparency and incentivizing resilience, and then of course increasing the economic sustainability of U.S. and allied drug manufacturing and distribution. 
And they do know that obviously a lot of these recommendations would require dedicated funding. So they had this report. It was really long, full of good recommendations. Again, went back to 2021. Some more of the recommendations um, were, this is going to start to sound very familiar, were to explore the creation or expansion of a virtual strategic stockpile of API reserve and other critical materials, and to do a better job of international harmonization. So I do point out, because this is oncology, um, that in the report, they specifically called out uh, chemotherapeutics and sterile pediatric oncology drugs as even though they're not part of the various critical drug or essential drug lists uh, that, that are floating around, that they call them out as being of special concern because they recognize in this report that these drugs were so critical and do tend to go into shortage um, on a regular basis. So they even got to the point where it was being reported that they were going to spend real money to develop advanced uh, generic drug making tech. They were looking at advanced manufacturing and onshoring. So this was all very exciting, but apparently everything that I've just talked about didn't actually get done. It got written down, but nothing happened. So what has ASCO done in this space? So this is sort of the historical what ASCO has done in this space. So back in 2010, 2011, we started working with uh, other concerned um, healthcare organizations and stakeholders. So groups such as anesthesiology, um, the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, the American Medical Association, USP and others. And together, these groups have held multiple roundtables and issued white papers with recommendations and proposals. Um, and we've done, I think, three or four of them since 2010, 2011. Um, back in 2017, we made the recommendation to examine drug shortages as a national security initiative. I think that seems very familiar to people now, and I think we tend to think that way. But in those earlier days, we really didn't. And so we we were really pushing the concept that, you know, this is this should be considered a national security problem. So again, just to sort of emphasize that a lot of these recommendations have been around for a while. Uh, the 100-day report, some of their recommendations are listed on the left and listed on the right are essentially matching uh, recommendations from ASCO that came out before the report. So everybody is seemingly idealized rowing in the same direction. It's just that these things aren't getting done. So, you know, the high level, creating redundancy for sterile injectables, uh, quality management and maturity rating systems, and additional insight into the supply chain and additional data collection for the FDA. So in the past, we have had some legislative successes. Um, FIDASIA Title 10, which I think was passed in 2012, we advocated uh, very strongly for that. That was the new law that required manufacturers to proactively report to FDA if they were planning a discontinuance in a drug or they knew that there would be a severe disruption to the supply of that drug. And then the in the CARES Act in 2020, they put in provision from, provisions from what had previously been known as the MEDS Act, where they expanded the scope of reporting to include API. They're requiring manufacturers to submit some sort of redundancy or contingency plans, and also requiring um, manufacturers of both finished drug and API to report the volume, the amount from each of those facilities, which is um, certainly information that they didn't necessarily have access to before. So that's all sort of historical. So we've been um, we've been very busy in the here and now. And so this is our CMO, Dr. Julie Graylow, uh, testifying before the um, ENC committee back in June. Um, we certainly have been communicating often with our members, uh, and I'll show you our drug shortage phase in a minute, uh, talking very closely to our members and hearing from our members in terms of what they're doing and what they're seeing on the ground, uh, taking those stories and sharing them with policymakers, uh, continued work with our drug shortage coalition, um, working with Congress, as I said, we've you know, testified on the Hill. We have submitted multiple statements to congressional committees and provided information to um, staff. Um, obviously, in close contact with the FDA, um, we've been meeting with a lot of 
public and private stakeholders and gathering information from them as well, and have been doing um, multiple uh, press interviews to, to get the word out there and to really emphasize the need for action. So we do have a dedicated drug shortage. Um, part of that is we basically list out all of our different statements for your reading pleasure. If you do want to take a look at those, we also have been updating um, on a regular basis the availability of drugs with acute uh, acute shortage issues where we will we will hear from the FDA if they have additional um, availability, whether through importation or other means, and we get that word out as quickly as possible to our members. Um, also, we had um, disease site experts um, from our um, the clinical side uh, develop disease specific guidance in addition to ethical principles and sort of principles of allocation. Um, and then finally, we have a form where you can submit your own stories to share with us uh, anonymously and, and de-identified if you would prefer. Um, so in terms of what we're hearing from our members, um, the themes that we're seeing in terms of mitigation strategies uh, will probably sound familiar to many of you. So delaying, delaying treatment, obviously, um, modifications of the doses and intervals. So perhaps 10 to 20% lower doses of carbo or cisplatin, longer cycles, inverting sequences treatment, obviously switching chemo drugs, substituting one platin for another, and then prioritizing patients with early stage cancer with intent to cure. So another way that we've tried to actively push out drug availability to our members is through social media. Um, so we haven't done that in a while, um, but as soon as we get new information, we do put that out on social media. So I mentioned that we are having ongoing conversations with different stakeholders, and um, we have met with a lot of different public and private groups. Um, so uh, the Civica model, some of you may be familiar with, where um, purchasers basically agree to pay a higher price, but for a guarantee supply and they have a six month um, buffer supply. Um, certainly FDA, ASHP, we've met with Duke Margolis. Um, Dr. Grelo attended the White House Cancer Drug Shortage Roundtable back in July, um, having some great conversations with the Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drug Company um, and also folks from uh, IQ, um, IQVM, the Hamilton Project. So the 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 reason for the the purpose of these conversations is for information sharing and to see how we can all better work together to convince policymakers that they need to take some action here. So one of the other um, events that we participated in was the USP, um, the United States Pharmacopeia uh, AC, ACS CAN webinar that was just last month, and Dr. Grelo represented ASCO. And um, I do want to call your attention to uh, USP's medicine supply map. And they have this, um, this very interesting um, chart that they come up with where they, uh, they, they have created something called a supply chain vulnerability score. And essentially, the higher your score, the more likely the drug is to go into shortage. And USP feeds in a ton of different factors. Um, into this sort of algorithm. And really three of them are the most important that they've identified. But you can see here how high the vulnerability score is for a lot of chemotherapy drugs, 95%, 60%, 90%. Um, and you can see a good match with that with some of the drugs that are currently in shortage or we're afraid will go into shortage um, fairly shortly. So I had quickly mentioned the White House uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy Drug Shortages Roundtable that was back in July. Um, and so basically the general themes that emerged from that was we need a trusted uh, neutral um, place to aggregate and access data. Um, for sure, we need better transparency and communication. Uh, something that we have been saying for a long time, and I think a lot of people um, you really feel the same way, is that we need to provide um, more information than just price. Because if the only information that you have when you're buying a drug is price, that's the only point of reference that you have for purchasing. But if you have additional information, um, then you 
factor that into your purchasing decisions as well. Um, they also discussed uh, minimum price protection for high risk essential drugs, um, buffers, strategic reserves. And again, at that meeting with the White House, the consensus was we've been talking about this. There's a lot of good ideas out there, but we really need to do something. So ASCO is planning an in-person event at our 2024 annual meeting that will be preceded by two multi-stakeholder webinars. Um, and the way we've set this up is webinar number one is early detection, webinar number two is treatment, and then the actual um, event at the annual meeting uh, will be prevention. And that will be set up as an annual meeting fireside chat. Uh, so more to come on that for those who are interested. So there is a lot of legislation that's been introduced. This is a list of some of the bills that we have endorsed or supported. A lot of them are aligned with the, the recommendations that I had mentioned earlier. Um, I'm happy to answer additional questions by email if anybody wants um, additional information on any of these bills or what they contain. Um, so... ASCO didn't do the IRA, let me make that clear. Um, but the reason I put this in, in the what is ASCO doing section is I think many of you are probably aware of the inflationary rebates and Medicare provision. Um, so it does apply largely to single source drugs. And the reason it becomes relevant here is because of those drugs that will face or could face an inflationary rebate there's a specific provision in the IRA that says CMS um, can actually waive or reduce the rebates if the drug is on an, the FDA shortage list, or if there's something like a natural disaster where you can totally anticipate a severe supply chain disruption. So even if the drug's not in shortage, but there's a tornado or something, then even if the drug is currently facing a rebate, CMS could waive or reduce that in anticipation of a future shortage. So. CMS put out an RFI um, a couple few months ago asking basically how do we do this without causing perverse incentives and it was actually very thoughtful in terms of um, obviously we want to be able to provide some relief as if a drug is on the FDA shortage list but how do we do it without those perverse incentives for somebody to kind of want to be on the shortage list? So we you know, tried to answer as thoughtfully as we could in terms of, you know, you really need to focus on those generic drugs that we've seen go into shortage over and over and over again, um, and certainly, obviously, look at oncology drugs. So the way that we at ASCO have been thinking about sort of getting to a permanent fix is sort of near term, medium term, long term. So the immediate focus. So what what are things you can do like right now or, or really, really soon? Right. So more transparency in the supply chain, more information to FDA, more notification, both to FDA and stakeholders, such as drug purchasers and patients. Um, better sharing of information, and do we need a national plan for the, the here and now in terms of how we respond to drug shortages? Because we're seeing real disparities with institutions that do and don't get drug. When there's a shortage, some institutions were fine, um, and others really suffered, and um, there's a number of reasons for that, but what do we need to do to make it more equitable for patient access? Um, then sort of a more medium term, looking at buffers or reserves, whether that's um, virtual or real. Um, you know, we think piloting payment alternatives through CMMI um, would be a good idea. There's um, lots of different suggestions out there for the changes that are needed in the payment system to help stabilize the market. And so we would certainly support piloting those payment alternatives. And for example, um, CMS proposed in a recent rule looking at additional payments to hospitals that stockpiled drugs. So those, those ideas are already sort of floating around. And then of course, long-term, we need a permanent fix to the market. We need to figure a way out of these incredibly important old sterile ge generic you know drugs selling for eight dollars a dose and the margins being so unsustainable that there is no incentive to remain in the market and that has got to be the long-term fix so i will stop there and i'm happy to take questions if any thank you so much for presenting that information dr Haggerty. so if anybody has any questions please type it into the chat or unmute your line
right? I don't see any questions coming in. It's a very quiet group today. Um, but thank you again for joining and joining early. We appreciate you, re, you know, juggling your schedule to accommodate us. Not a problem. And if anybody's shy and has any um, follow-up questions via email or would like to learn anything more, please, I, Nicole has my email address. Feel free to reach out to me directly. Perfect. We put it in the chat and we'll forward that to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. So we have, uh, to round out our day, just a couple uh, announcements from our corporate sponsors. Um, I am pleased to introduce Bobby's son from Pfizer. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Take that. So can, let me just share my screen. We actually aren't sharing my... screens today. It's just a five minute verbal introduction. Oh, is that right? Okay. Um, never mind. Let me stop this then. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay, yeah. So um can you guys see me okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so my name is Bobby Sun. I'm with the uh, Pfizer Hematology. I'm one of your uh, local representatives down here in the Southern California area. I promote uh, all the hematology products versus Bosilip or Bazutinib for CML. I also have uh, Vesponza or Inotuzumab for relapsed refractory ALL. And new, but not, uh, newest medication that was approved a couple of months ago was l or l for relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. And I just wanted to just take a couple of minutes of your time just to share the uh, high level overview of this medication because it's a new, uh, not only to Pfizer, but it's a new technology in how doctors treat relapse refractory multiple myeloma. So just a high level overview. Uh, it is indicated for patients that have relapse refractory multiple myeloma. It is um, an off the shelf BCMA directive by specific immunotherapy. And it is indicated for patients who had at least four prior lines of therapy including a proteasome inhibitor, immunomodulatory agent, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. And uh, this indication is approved by the FDA on the acceler accelerated approval uh, pathway uh, based on the great efficacy of Alrexio in response rate and the durability of response. So, um, you know, just kind of wanted to share with you guys how you can access this medication and how it's being utilized. Um, it is part of a REMS program. I'm sure you guys heard of the risk evaluation and mitigation strategy program with some other drugs in the, in the currently in the market um, because of the box warning for uh, neurotoxicity, including ICANS and CRS associated with Alrexio, there is box warning. So uh, there is a REMS program. So before anyone can access this medication, uh, the, the prescribing doctor or physician needs to be REMS certified. It takes about 20 minutes uh, online for training and enrollment. And also, um, it does require a pharmacist at the hospital um, to be certified for REMS as well. And I'll cover that later in the, in the dosing. So, one second here, I'm trying to scroll through my slides here. Yeah. So, the dosing, it is again, it's a rapid subcutaneous injection. Recommendation is in the abdomen or the thigh. It's, a, it's ready to be used as a single dose file, and it's a fixed dose, uh, fixed dose with no weight, weight based calculations. And, um, you know, there is a step-up program for the step-up dosing program for this uh, regimen. Uh, the two, there's two doses that are given again in the hospital because of the uh, CRS and neurotoxicity. Um, but those two, two doses that are given in the hospital, uh, which where the patient has to be hospitalized for five days, is, is gonna be given free for, uh, for, from, the, from Pfizer to the hospital. So that one's gonna be covered. And then they go to a weekly dosing of 76 milligrams. And uh, if they have a response, they can go to every two weeks of uh, uh, Rexvio. Um, any, any questions or thoughts over here so far? I know it's, it's a lot and fast. If you have any um, information that you can send to us, we'll, we'll include that in the follow-up email. Yeah, definitely. What I, what I, like, I, had, um, I had prepared uh, some, some seed, uh, the coding and how you guys can access this medication through, uh, you know, our, our, our pamphlet. We can send it out to um, to you guys and just email it out to me. Or just if you have any questions or any resources that you need, please reach out. Um, yeah, sure. Contact information was put into the chat. So everybody has that, but we'll also include that in the follow-up email. Yeah. And then also uh, one more thing about, about the uh, 
I'm sure you guys heard of Pfizer Oncology together. If you had utilized uh, Pfizer, uh, you know, oncology products in the past, but this is also a Rexio as part of this as well. There is a special um, uh, patient access navigator. I'm sure, I don't know if you know Alicia, Alicia Weed. She is going to be dedicated to this product and she's going to help out with any access or financial assistance, any treatment coordination or anything that will drive uh, supporting support during your treatment for the patients that you guys need help with or assistance with. So uh, please give me a call. You can also, you know, contact your rep that's going to be coming, it might be coming into your office or there's, we have access to CAMs or FMDs or a lot of resources to help you guys out because there's a lot of information, a lot of nuances that goes along with this treatment. But it is exciting because it's a new way of treating uh, relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. And um, if you have any questions or thoughts, please reach out to me and I'll direct you to the right place. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, on to our next um, corporate sponsor, Tracy Hira from Aveo Oncology. Thank you, Nicole. Hi, uh, my name is Tracy Hara, and I am the Director of National Accounts at Aveo Oncology. So thank you for giving me a few minutes. Um, I wanted to just, just two quick things that I wanted to um, mention today. Um, and before I do that, I believe Christy is going to be entering um, contact information for the local oncology account manager who could not be here today, Michael Tadros, and some of you may know him, um, but his information will be in the chat. And um, I think he probably works with uh, all of your offices. And if, oh, well, that's actually my contact information, but that absolutely works. And you can reach out to me. I'll put you in touch with Michael, um, should you have questions or need further information. Um, but again, um, so I work with the payers in the uh, Western half of the country. Um, and I work closely with Michael who uh, works with all of your offices. Um, Aveo Oncology, as you may know, is the manufacturer of Fotivda. Uh, an oral chemotherapy for relapsed refractory renal cell carcinoma. Um, and uh, one of the things that I just wanted to mention with regards to Aveo Oncology and some of the um, some of the information that may be particularly interesting and relevant to this group here is Aveo Oncology has a patient services program, the Aveo ACE program, um, which is our specialty hub. Um, it's one of the most generous um, in, in the industry. And we work uh, kind of tirelessly with patients on benefits investigation, on uh, patient support programs and all of that. Um, so I would highly encourage the group to, if you aren't familiar with it, um, if you aren't familiar with it at this time, that uh, you ask Michael for some more information. And um, as Nicole mentioned in the um, follow-up packet, I'm going to send information um, over to the folks at MOASC to share in that follow-up uh, to give you more information about our program uh, should that should that need come up in your practice. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to uh, give you back a few minutes of your time unless there's any questions about either Fotivda, Aveo, or um, our patient services programs. Thank you so much, Tracy. We Thanks. appreciate. Oh, does somebody have a question? Okay, I guess not. Um, we appreciate all that you and Aveo Oncology does for our patients um, and your support of MOASC and its efforts. So thank you for being here today. Um, so yes, we finished early. We're gonna give you some time back. Thank you all for joining us today. If you have any questions or need more information, feel free to reach out to us. Um, but this concludes today's webinar. So enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.